Hello, I'm Andrew Lowe, and welcome to In Pursuit of the Perfect Portfolio. Today, I have the great pleasure and privilege of speaking with one of the founders of the mutual fund industry, John Bogle, or Jack, as he prefers to be called. Uh, Jack, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. So we're really thrilled to have the opportunity to find out a little bit more about uh, the beginnings, your beginnings, and how you got started. So if you don't mind, I'd like to take you back to 1949 uh, and this article that came out in Fortune magazine called uh, Big Money in Boston. Can you uh, tell us a bit about that and uh, how that influenced you? Uh, sure. And at first, it was one of the great breaks of my lifetime, no question about that. Uh, I was in Firestone Library at Princeton, just opened, brand new, beautiful library. And I can remember the sun coming in over my shoulder, and I can remember opening Fortune magazine at a time when, December of 1949, and when one was thinking about one's senior thesis. Uh, I was going to graduate in 1951, you can't start too early at all. And uh, I was a very contrarian young thinker, if thinker is a good word and uh, very skeptical of everything. Any knowledge that was delivered, I said, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, let's take a really close look at that. Uh, and uh, so I didn't, I was a contrarian. I wanted to write a thesis on, on, a, on a subject that nobody had ever written on before. Uh, and I opened Fortune magazine, and there is Big Money in Boston, the name of the article about Mass Investors Trust, um, the oldest, the largest, and perhaps importantly compared to what happened later on, the lowest cost mm -hmm. fund in the field, a very diversified, basically S&P 500-like portfolio, not any magic there. And uh, the industry was described as tiny but contentious. Its total assets were around two or two and a half billion. And I thought, well, by God, I'm tiny and I'm contentious <laughs> and no one's ever written on this before that I knew of. There may have been something later, but I have never seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I picked on the spot in the library that topic for my thesis, hmm. the open-end investment company or the mutual fund. And uh, there was very, very little research uh, available on it, very little, very few articles, some in the, in the legal journals uh, about the value of diversification for estates and things like that. And uh, then we had uh, things like um, critical articles, article from the head of the SEC, chairman of the SEC, saying mutual funds were going to change the marketplace mm -hmm. at this tiny size. And they haven't done it yet, but maybe they will someday. Uh, but there it was. I wrote to the Investment Company Institute, then known as the National Association of Investment Companies, and asked them for the data that they had. And uh, seven months later, I got a reply. Hmm. It was just a one-man shop, <laughs> and he finally got around to me. I think it took seven months. And so the ambit of my research was going to be very limited. Mm -hmm. uh, so I made it as deep as I could. I got all these old Wiesenberger so-called books that were historically coming out every year and looked into the industry and made some opinions about it and uh, read everything I could find from the hearings to the 1940 Act, Investment Company Act of 1940 which was only, at that point, nine years old, and uh, it seems amazing to me, and I was on my way. The thesis is just an extraordinary volume that I would recommend everybody read, uh, because I, I was blown away by some of the things that you yeah. covered. So I want to mention a couple of things about the thesis. First of all, you began as a sophomore in terms of doing your research, and the fact that you actually covered so many different aspects of open-end funds. And we had a lot of data on turnover and all those kind of things. Mutual fund turnover was, portfolio turnover is about the same as the market. But poor little mutual funds were 1% of the market then. They weren't going to do very much. Mm -hmm. And now mutual funds are, I guess, 25, 30% of the market. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that gets anticipating where we go from here. Um, if mutual fund industry today was the same way it was when I wrote the thesis or thereafter, it would all be actively managed funds. Mm -hmm. That was the business. Right. And uh, it was all in those days, this is a very important thing that happened, uh, it was very diversified. Mm -hmm. Just about every major fund 
looked like the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Mm. And you could look at the volatility. Wiesenberger would score that in his annual volumes. And you could find a couple of funds that were maybe 7% more volatile. More, and you could find some funds that were 10% less volatile. Mm -hmm. But the idea of 30% more volatile, 30% less volatile just wasn't there. Except balanced funds, different case, of course. They were just as volatile as they were supposed to be. That is two-thirds of volatility of the market. So um, it, it, all those things developed. But then the industry changed, mm -hmm. and we had the boom of the go-go era. Right. And the, uh, the idea of a S&P 500-like fund, this is before the S&P 500 in index was even created, the index fund was even created, uh, everybody went into the go-go thing. They totally dominated. Right. Go-go funds, what is that? Funds that are created to have remarkable records, to buy junk, uh, oftentimes to buy letter stock from company founders mm -hmm. at 50 cents in the dollar mm -hmm. and put it into their portfolio at 100 cents in the dollar. Mm. This is a very easy way to get return. good performance. Yeah. So um, after graduation, uh, what then? So I definitely wanted to be in Philadelphia if I could possibly find. And so I looked at a bank here. Uh, I was at a brokerage firm, if you can imagine me in a brokerage firm. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and, uh, and I looked at Wellington Fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Morgan, who I'd met at Princeton, mm -hmm. Walter L. Morgan, my great mentor, who I met when he was 50, and knew him for 50 more years. Wow. He died three months after his 100th birthday Amazing. in uh, 1998. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so he was a great mentor. He obviously liked me. Um, he said publicly, after I'd gone through this tremendous change in his company, um, that hiring me was the best decision he had ever made. Mm -hmm. Certainly a nice compliment to read in an article. We had a great time together. I mean, he actually did not, to be clear, spend a lot of time with me. Mm. Uh, but enough time to get, he knew what I could do and what I couldn't do. He exposed me to this little 75 person, approximately Wellington Management Company, had 145 million in assets when I walked in the door. Mm -hmm. And it was probably the, let me say, the seventh largest firm in the business. Mm -hmm. And the largest balance fund, that was our stock and trade. Mm -hmm. All we offered was the balance fund in those days. But it was, those were great times, happy times. He was an extraordinary man, a pillar of integrity, very much a renaissance man. Mm -hmm. He was interested in all aspects of the business. He was also an outdoorsman, he went hunting and fishing and all those kind of things. You just couldn't have found a more uh, thoughtful, well, man who lived a great life. Mm -hmm. So I was glad to be a little part of it. Now, in 1960, you published an article uh, under the pen name John Armstrong. And this was perhaps the beginning of your thoughts regarding indexation? Can you talk a bit about that? And yeah, actually the beginning of my thoughts go all the way back to the thesis. Sure. And I, I do, do explain why the index and how it works. Mm -hmm. When I say that mutual funds can make no claim to su superiority, a little superficial. Uh, we didn't have the kind of database we had today, probably just as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, But then the industry changed. And before it changed, we had really a pretty good industry. We weren't selling a bunch of wild funds uh, this is an industry group. Uh, direct distribution was coming into play, and that was the strongest part of the industry for a while. Mm -hmm. But we're selling middle-of-the-road funds, mm -hmm. either stock funds or balance funds, and uh, concentrating on that and working through broker-dealers who had some, with, with our wholesalers, through broker-dealers who had some idea of if not suitability. I don't think that was in the books though, in those days. might have been. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, kind of a, uh, not, a, not a speculative market at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, then all of a sudden comes the change, the go-go era. Well, the era I described in 1960 in that article, and let me first be very, very blunt about it. Of course, I'm a party line guy. That's why I wrote the article. Mm -hmm. And we ran a managed fund, and I'm happy to prove that, that the, um, the idea of an index fund is bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, that actually is a poor formulation on my part because it was really 
there should be a Dow Jones Industrial Average Index Fund. Right. And when you go through what it takes to run one, it's mm -hmm. an extremely complex average to operate. And the amount of turnover you've had, and the amount you have to, you have to change the holdings with some frequency, because it's price related. Uh, not price related, but market by the number of stocks have to, have to always total 30. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, and it would be very expensive to do. So I look at this terrible index, really a bad index, although in the long run it's, it produces, like any other diversified portfolio, mm -hmm. about the same returns as the market. Mm -hmm. every, every diversified portfolio really does that. Uh, but uh, it was a bad index in a good industry, mm -hmm. in an industry which is playing everything down the middle. And yeah, no, they're not winning by anything because they have costs. Uh, we didn't have a big performance race. But it was a kind of a slow-moving, conservative industry. And if you put your money into a mutual fund, by and large, you were not going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And then we have, and that's when I wrote the article. Mm. The math didn't work. And then I did comparisons. The funds had actually done better than the, than the Dow Jones. And, and better, I think, then than the S&P. I, I did have a couple of other data points. And uh, then everything changes. Mm -hmm. We get a good index, a great index, mm -hmm. a market cap weighted index. It was available then, but people weren't paying any attention. Standard & Poor's 50, it was then. And it was not you know, particularly well known or popular. It was all the Dow, the Dow, the Dow, the Dow. Up 20 points, down 20 points in those days, big. Up 100 points every once in a while later on. Uh, but um, we, and, and along comes a, 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 a bad industry. Mm -hmm. This industry became a total marketing business. Mm -hmm. It became an opportunistic business. It became a business creating uh, expectations on past performance that could never possibly be duplicated in right. the future. So not the whole industry, but a large part of it. And very, very few sponsors were exempt from this little disease mm -hmm. called gogoism, right. or whatever you want to call it. So, summers to summarize, of course I was defending the status quo because I was been in the business for nine years. What the heck else am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. But it was a reasoned right. status quo. Right. Indexing the yes, the Dow Jones average was a terrible thing to to have tried to emulate, and I don't think anybody has ever even bothered it. So, um, and then things changed. So there's a true reason, mm -hmm. and then there's the fact that, that the times change. And uh, as I think it's Justice Frankfurter said, Andy, sometimes wisdom comes late. Mm -hmm. Sometimes wisdom never comes. So when, even when it comes late, it's a good idea to honor it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> So in the 1960s, there was a merger between Wellington and Ivest, and you've called that one of the worst ideas of a merger uh, in history. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that maybe started uh, you know, creating the seeds of the Vanguard Fund? It was sure, and, and, and number one, even before we get to that, uh, my first real exposure to investment um, performance, if you will, was working with the wholesalers mm -hmm. and also doing a lot of data for them on performance. So I was well aware of the difficulties Wellington Fund was having, mm -hmm. be keeping its competition. They didn't pay, the world didn't pay that much attention. The gaps were not large. We were at the very much a mediocre balanced fund, but with all the strength of our, our wholesaling force and our uniqueness, everybody else largely selling stock fund, we made we were the best selling fund in the, in the in the marketplace year after year in the fund marketplace. So um, when performance started to slip, we started to get new managers, mm -hmm. and the new manager was not as good as the old one, mm -hmm. and they turned over faster. In other words, things changed, and I realized this is a very hard business. Mm -hmm. and it's hard to be good, and the more you try. Uh, sometimes <laughs> the worse it is. Right. Uh, maybe you should stop trying. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a very tough business. So then comes uh, the change in the marketplace in the go-go era, and our balance funds, the dominant fund in the, the, the balance fund share of, of the marketplace cash flow, drops from forty percent to one percent. Wow. And it's like uh, the example I use, Andy, is. Uh, 
I've got this nice little bagel shop. And it's nutritious, it's hard, crusty, it's good for you. And all around are these donut shops. Mm. And they're sweet. They offer nothing in the way of nutrition except something bad. They crumble. <laughs> but if everybody else in the street is selling donuts and nobody's buying bagels, mm -hmm. the bagel shop owner has one option. Right. Start selling donuts. Yeah. I hate that argument. Mm -hmm. But that's the business argument. And for all the preaching about idealism, if you don't have a vehicle uh, with which to offer that idealism, you go out of business. Mm -hmm. So you have to adjust. So I tried, to, I tried a number of, I, I knew we had to have an equity fund. That was my first level of thinking. By the way, in the middle of all this, Mr. Morgan called me into his office one day and said, I don't want to deal with this present era. I don't understand it. I'm too conservative. Um, and uh, I want you to start running the company today. Hmm. And I thought, of course, wow. you surely picked the right man. <laughs> I was 35 years old <laughs> with a little more <laughs> self-confidence than my, than my uh, experience would have, would have indicated. And so I knew the first step. I had no doubt. I thought about it a lot before this meeting. I uh, had no doubt we had to have bring an equity fund into the business. So there we were. And along comes this opportunity with iVest Fund. Mm -hmm. And they seem to meet, go beyond our, our expectations. Yes, they've got the GoGo Fund, mm -hmm. which had a pretty shaky record. I knew that. Uh, I think they, deep down, they, they, they'd never admit it, but you know, it was when they were a bunch of private investors yeah. and they could produce some data. I had trouble getting it past the NASD. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was my job to do for the company, and I did, and I was honest, but maybe not quite as honest as I should have been about my own skepticism. So, um, and I was an, an, uh, an important part of NASD Investment Companies Committee, mm -hmm. so I knew the people down there, and they probably were more likely to take my word than mm -hmm. so. And, and my word was good, but uh, little did I know what I was getting into. So we have the, the GoGo Fund, and about a year after we acquired it, it had the best record in the mutual fund industry, or maybe the second best. Mm -hmm. not, I don't want to talk about its validity, mm -hmm. but there it was in the numbers. And uh, so they also had a, had a small pension business. Mm -hmm. Thought a great accompaniment to the fund business, always thought that. Mm -hmm. And then they had, of course, just what we needed for Wellington Fund, brilliant managers. Mm -hmm. Brilliant managers, write that down. <laughs> and uh, I, can, I can remember one of them saying, before the merger took place on June 6th, 1966. Uh, I can't wait to get my hands on Wellington Fund. Huh. And they got their hands on Wellington Fund, and it was a disaster. Uh, it had typically had about a 65% equity ratio at the high of the market at the end of 73. It had an 83% uh, ratio, mm. equity ratio, 83% in stocks, this conservative balance fund, mm. with more junk than you would want to have right. as compared to the blue chips of the old days. And Wellington Fund and their 10-year tenure had the worst 10-year record of any balance fund in the industry. Mm. And the funny thing about investing is it's just as hard to be worst as it is to be best. <laughs> <laughs> but they did it. Yeah. And their, their, their IVEST fund, they created a couple more funds. One was called Trustees' Equity, which is not structured as if a trustee should own it, but they were offered that. Mm -hmm. And it collapsed along with IVEST. And then they started a fund called Technivest Fund. Mm. This, they, they were the money guys. Mm -hmm. And I was the marketing administrative overall head of the company. But there was no question that they were supposed to know more about it than I did. Mm -hmm. And I hate to say it, sounds kind of bragging, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. They didn't. Uh, superficial um, and persuasive, uh, suited for the go-go era, but not suited for what followed. Right. And so, so you know, it said the, the mouse swallowed the elephant was one of the things about something like that mm -hmm. uh, after the merger took place. And I knew it was a gamble, an interesting sidelight. I knew it wasn't going to be durable. Mm -hmm. So I gave each of them, as our celebration dinner, a little silver like, card tray. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of each one, I had soldered 
a U.S. silver dollar. Mm -hmm. And on it it said, peace. <laughs> <laughs> but there was to be no peace. Everything fell apart. Yeah. You know, they fired me. And they tried to put out in a press release that said I resigned. And I said, no, 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 no. You fired me. Mm. Don't put I resigned. I wouldn't resign for anything in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I recoup, if you will, at the poker table what I lost at the craps table? Mm -hmm. I looked around in a couple of institutions here in town to see if they wanted to get in more active in the mutual fund business. And there was no interest. I tried to buy, thought about buying at least, a little company down in Delaware owned by the DuPont family. Uh, not a large mutual fund company. Thought I could do something with that. And somehow that never came to pass. I guess they decided not to sell it or I decided I didn't want to buy it. So I'm left with one option. To persuade the directors of the Wellington Fund, where I'm chairman of the board and chief executive, uh, to not do what they did at Wellington Management Company, their supplier of services, uh, which is fire the chairman of the board and chief executive. And uh, so they said, well, give us some more options. They didn't like that. So proposal two was to leave them in investment management. Although I have to head, after the job they had done, how a responsible director could have done that is beyond my, mm -hmm. is beyond my ken. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, and we do distribution, and, and, and distribution was kind of complicated, very difficult for funds to spend their own money on it at that time, and it still is in a certain way. And so I'm, I'm left with, we'll be the administrator, and they will be the distributor and the, and the investment manager. And we agreed to stay out of distribution and investment management. Hmm. So it gets done, and we got started on September 24th, 1974, and interesting enough, unlike the question you asked, we actually took over operations on September 19th, 1974, bef hmm. before there was even a company. Hmm. And all that happened in May of 75, I'm trying to get the management to understand this, although I, I've written about it incorrectly myself, uh, is all that happened in May 1, 1975, so the shareholders approved new fee agreements with Wellington Management Company with lower fees. This is not an exciting date, it's a pro forma date. So, um, for me, Founders Day, if you will, is uh, September 24th, 1974. Mm -hmm. And we started off, we had 28 people, counting me. We were doing, you know, making sure what we had was called the belly up theory. We would be in charge, we Vanguard, the new Vanguard, a name I picked out of a book of naval history mm -hmm. uh, without any consulting with anybody either, <laughs> naturally. And uh, the, so, we started, and uh, we were legal, uh, comp regulatory, compliance, uh, shareholder record keeping, and fund financial mm -hmm. portfolios and all that. And that was that. Hmm. And uh, we had agreed not to go into, as I think I said, not to go into marketing and not to go into investment management. So here we are with what we shall call a Pyrrhic victory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Uh, so I wasn't, you know, obviously going to be happy with a Pyrrhic victory. And when one of them said to me, aren't you going to be bored? One of my adversaries and I best, aren't you going to be bored? Well, I didn't say anything, but I thought, my thought was just you wait. <laughs> and so the door opens. This is the magical part of it. Mm -hmm. And the door opens. Um, and that idea of the index fund, written about in my thesis, mm -hmm. uh, is exhumed, mm -hmm. exhumed. And it was importantly, very importantly, as I recall now, influenced by the article Paul Samuelson wrote mm -hmm. in the first issue of the Journal of Portfolio Management. What timing! Mm -hmm. That was October 1st of 1974. Mm -hmm. And I read, I, I read these journals. I'm not sure many of my counterparts in the industry do. Mm -hmm. And most of them I cannot understand. I'm not trying to brag about that. Uh, but I like to see what academic thinking, and intelligent thinking, logical thinking is, is doing, because you all don't see the things in the future. And there is this article called Challenge to Judgment by mm -hmm. Dr. Paul Samuelson. And I thought, you know, let me do first a little research. Uh, and I did a little research and took the average performance of the 
the equity funds the previous 35 years and showed that the S&P uh, won by 1.3% a year, I think was the number. And then I compounded it for 35 years. You can imagine what that looked like. Right. And then I based, showed the directors what a $10,000 investment would be mm -hmm. worth in the two. And then I crossed that out. I actually have my working papers cross that out and put, basically, if you will, the hell with $10,000. Let's do it with a million. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see it all scratched right down there yeah. to make it more impressive. And implied that we'd be good for pension funds, too, at least. And... Uh, so that 1.3%, a very crude number, I don't mind saying that at all, was about the cost of funds, a little bit different. And uh, so I, I, I had the, the economic research backup, but that would have gotten me nowhere mm -hmm. without the imprimatur of somebody who really was universally respected for mm -hmm. his intelligence and wisdom and that would be Dr. Samuelson. Mm -hmm. So the directors, I think, they voted unanimously to favor it. One of them decided he didn't want to serve on the board because he didn't believe in it, but as a director of Vanguard, he voted to start it. And uh, so we got the vote unanimous, uh, in part because of my research, in part because of Dr. Samuelson, and in part, I think the board was just sick and tired of controversy <laughs> and wanted to give me something. Huh. They said, mm. of course, first, you can't get into investment management. Mm. That was the agreement. And I said, this fund is not managed. Now you're laughing. That's amazing. <laughs> That's just amazing. But it's true. And uh, I said it with a straight face. And uh, so we were off and running. The, under the underwriting was a complete flop. Mm. The underwriters were going to do $250 million. And they did $11.2 million. And I said, oh, my God, we can't even buy round lots of all 500 stocks. Hmm. And they said, well, why don't we just give everybody their, their money back, kill the underwriting. And I said, wait a minute, we have the first world's first index. We're not going right. to give that back. Right. So, so can I go back to the origins of the very first index fund? Because one of the things that you don't nearly uh, mention as much as I think deserves is the role that research, your research, has played into this. We typically think of the index fund as relatively simple and passive, but there is nothing simple or passive about the effort that it took to change people's perspective of what an index fund could accomplish. And in particular, there's a lot of numbers and a lot of thinking involved in the construction of the index fund. So is that fair to say that you were probably the first real quant in that you actually spend a lot of time thinking about numbers and working out the implications of these uh, kinds of structures from a research perspective before any dollar was ever invested. Well, I think that's right, although my, my research was superficial. I'm, I'm the first to admit that. And I, I wrote about this in one of my books, but uh, I was kind of, I, I use this in a different context, I was kind of an arithmetic quant. and. The people that didn't like it were algorithmic quants. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Paul Samuelson was very much in the pragmatic side of indexing rather than the theoretical side. And challenged to judgment, his article in the Journal of Portfolio Management said, uh, there is no brute evidence, was the phrase he used, that actively managed funds can beat the standard and unmanaged standard and poorest 500 index. Mm -hmm. So why doesn't someone start one? Mm -hmm. I mean, he challenged, basically challenged me, didn't know at the mm -hmm. time, to start one. So um, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about how it is the fund came about. And I bridle with the, the, the idea that it has something to do with modern portfolio theory, mm -hmm. or the efficient market theory, mm -hmm. or French and Fama. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard of either of them. Sure. Uh, and uh, nor had I heard about the people at Wells Fargo, right. who were pursuing this in a highly quantitative way, basically looking for a way to beat the market, is how it started out there. Mm -hmm. And then they did the pension fund for Samsonite, first index account, mm -hmm. uh, which of course failed. Right. Because they had used yet another index, New York Stock Exchange Index, which had to be changed had changed the portfolio every right. day. It was an equal weighted index. Yeah. Right. And I mean, it's just a very foolish index. And the, right. They're all so brilliant. <laughs> I don't know why they pick such a, such a silly index. But um, the, the index fund, from my standpoint, I'll give Samuelson great credit for the inspiration. But the, the ideas behind it 
efficient market theory, modern portfolio theory, or whatever it might be, uh, had nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Mm-hmm. I, didn't, you know, I didn't even know what those things were. Right. And uh, so it was, it was an original in, the, in that sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a, it's a pragmatic issue for me. I looked at the record. Funds didn't do it. Why would they do it in the future? They have costs. Mm-hmm. And all this kind of emerges into a very cogent overall theory. Mm-hmm. And it worked then and it works now. Of course, Paul Samuelson <clears throat> is the consummate economic theorist and uh, <clears throat> has written extensively uh, about investing. But he was particularly captivated by what you were doing and gave Vanguard a bit of a shot in the arm in his Newsweek article, didn't he? Yeah, to say the least. I, um, as we were getting towards the underwriting, I'm pretty sure of my dates here, maybe, maybe July of, of 1976, he wrote a, he had a regular column in Newsweek magazine, full page. And uh, I can probably show it to you. Um, let's take a second here. I know it's in here somewhere. If you want a little visual. Oh, is it uh, this one? Yeah, that's it. <clears throat> there it is. Wow. And uh, he doesn't mention Vanguard. Mm-hmm. Um, he talks, talks about First Index Investment Trust, the name I chose, mm-hmm. because we were first and I wanted to brag about it. Mm-hmm. It later on became Vanguard 500 Index when those kind of things didn't matter. Mm-hmm. And the SEC did a lot of research on the name, mm-hmm. and they couldn't find anybody else that did it. So we are the first index fund, mm-hmm. index mutual fund. Mm-hmm. No question about that. And uh, so he was hoping that someone would start an index fund, and they did. Mm. Where there is a demand, nature will find a way. Sooner than I dared expect, my implicit prayer has been answered. There is something coming to the market I see from a crisp new prospectus, uh, something called the Vanguard First Index Investment Trust. It meets four of my first prudent requirements, available for the person of modern family of modern means, $1,500 to a million or more. Proposes to match the S&P 500, being essentially unmanaged, number three, its management and expenses charge will, will be only about two-tenths of one percent. Mm-hmm. And number four, the commissions frittered away in turnover should be extremely low for an index fund. Best of all, such an index fund gives that broadest diversification needed to maximize mean return with minimum portfolio balance, variance, and volatility. Then he adds, this is interesting. A professor's prayers are rarely answered in full. <laughs> this is a no-load fund. This is not a no-load fund. Right off the top of your modest safe comes a 6% commission. Mm-hmm. Um, of good ideas like bad ones are not bought, apparently they have to be sold. Well, he wrote that in August 1776, a little bit later than I said. Um, and uh, by the time we got the index offering done on August 31st, 1776, um, the beginning of the next year, Vanguard took over distribution mm-hmm. and made everything no load. Wow. So the professor's prayers were answered in yeah. full <laughs> six, seven months later, eight months later. And that's an extraordinary difference from the rest of the industry because in those days, five or six percent was not unusual. Yeah, actually, they were higher. We had Wellington with seven and a half percent. My goodness. And the, there were eights, and there were eight and a half mm-hmm. because dealers needed to be paid. For basically, they didn't look at it this way, I'm afraid, but uh, basically needed to be played for locking up that money. Mm-hmm. This was not a heavy trading industry at all. So given the challenging beginnings, what do you think are the factors that explain the incredible success of Vanguard? Uh, you just passed the $4 trillion mark. I was never in this to build a big... Mm-hmm. A big business. I tell people, Andy, that I never had a goal of building a colossus, but I was too stupid to realize that if you gave investors the best deal they would ever get, you'd build a colossus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Our stupidity is quite un, quite unlimited. So what 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 was the key? Well, the, there were, I'm going to call them mechanical keys, structural keys. Uh, you start with the structure. Mm-hmm. 
and the mutual structure. You're designed to serve shareholders. Mm -hmm. You're talking about cost advantages. You're talking about, particularly in the bond area, so obvious. Uh, you can take, uh, you don't have to reach for yield to have a competitive yield in the marketplace because mm -hmm. your expense ratios are going to run 12 basis points compared to 82. Mm -hmm. So you, you're going to win if you can narrow the marketplace into segments where there'll be much less obscuring of what true performance is. And that led to the rise of the, of the uh, defined, defined maturity bond funds. Mm -hmm. Long, intermediate, short. No fussing around. You choose. Mm -hmm. You tell us how you want to balance risk and income. And uh, so it, it's just it's a pro forma thing. There are money market funds even easier. Mm -hmm. The higher the cost, the lower the return, because you can't do much cheating in, in the money market area. And in the long run, the same thing proves to be true in the stock market. Not evident in the short run. Uh, but So it's structure, structure, structure. Uh, and then strategy. Focus on the place where cost makes the most obvious difference. Mm -hmm. And that would be the index fund, where one index fund is going to be identical to the other, and whoever has the lowest cost will win, or bond funds, money market funds, or any fund that's uh, more like commodity in nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, so structure, uh, not quite me as Van der Rohe here, I think he said the opposite, but um, strategy follows structure. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's the mechanical part. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, there is the missionary part. Um, I've written, just finished my 11th book. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I have 560 speeches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I can't imagine a more eloquent spokesman for this business and this industry than you and all of the writings and speeches that you've given. And in fact, in dealing with some of the academic theories like the EMH or the efficient markets hypothesis, in 2003, you proposed the uh, CMH, and, uh, I, which I thought was brilliant, and I teach it to my students now. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, <laughs> I'm a great one for playing with ideas to try and make them a little more interesting. And so I wanted something that paralleled the EMH, the efficient market hypothesis. And it didn't take hours to figure out if you say cost matters hypothesis, you get CMH. And uh, the one thing we know, everybody knows, academics, brokers, whatever it might be, investors, is the efficient market hypothesis is often right, but it is not always right. Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, if you think the markets are highly efficient and they're not, you're going to pay a penalty for that. And that happens periodically along the role of the markets. Uh, but the CMH always works. Mm -hmm. It is the, even Morningstar with their sophisticated Morningstar statistical, fund statistical service, the best one around. Um, the, the, there's, there, with all their sophisticated means of, of identifying star funds and so on, they say when it comes down to it, you would be better off picking funds on the basis of their cost than you would on the basis of our, our rating system. Mm -hmm. Now that's a pretty good concession. The CMH has never quite caught on, and so I'm, of course, working on another one, which I'll sneak in here, my favorite subject. I am trying to get the industry and the press, the media, I guess I should say, to focus on the difference between ETFs and TIFs, another play on words, exchange-traded funds of all kinds of every way, shape, and form in traditional index funds, uh, based on the original uh, Vanguard platform. Broad diversification, doesn't mm -hmm. have to be the S&P 500. Total stock market is fine. Total international market is fine. Total bond market is fine. Uh, very broad, uh, very durable over time. You're not picking a segment of the market, you're picking the whole market. Very low cost. Uh, and uh, the TIFs are, are much less volatile in their cash flows ETF bond is like this. You never know what's going to happen. And uh, in a given month, it can look like investors are fleeing the market. Mm -hmm. And it's just the spider had $20 billion of redemptions for the month. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it's, it's, the data ought to be active funds, traditional index funds, exchange traded funds. Mm -hmm. But I can't sell it to anybody. I've been trying for years. <laughs> and I'm not giving up. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> 
but it's a it's a very different thing. And in this this during the twenty o five to twenty o nine the twenty o seven to twenty o nine period, mm-hmm. there was not a single month in which TIFs had an outflow. Mm-hmm. Not a single month in that period. Uh, the the uh, active funds were probably averaging <coughs> negative, I don't know, 35 billion or something, and uh, and the exchange traded funds actually had more in total, mm-hmm. but they had one month where they took in 70 billion dollars mm-hmm. toward the market high, and another month toward the market low, when they when they uh, redeemed mm-hmm. uh, 40 billion. In just two those two months, the swing, a hundred hundred billion dollar swing in cash flow mm-hmm. between the high month and the low month, and the swing for for the uh, traditional index funds might have been two billion dollars. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so there's a difference, a difference in holdings, a difference in how you look at the market in the mm-hmm. years ahead. This is a very different market, mm-hmm. and it's a trading market, it's a speculative market, it's a it's an entrepreneur's market, mm-hmm. entrepreneurs like those of the go-go era. Mm-hmm. They're in business to find a niche, niche as they say, in the marketplace that, that nobody has touched yet. It has nothing to do with it, good or not. Mm-hmm. It's an idea of what can we do to sell. And hardly a, hardly a traditional index fund has started, I don't think, in the last five or six years. Uh, well, everything is, it's easy to get into the business. Uh, it's easy to make a big noise about how good your performance is. It's easy to claim smart beta. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, without any statistical backup at all, it doesn't do well, mm-hmm. and no question it has yet to outperform over ten years, mm. seven years, five years, three years, and one year. Uh, the average smart beta fund has yet to outperform the S and P 500. Right. You know, for somebody who is so modest about his forecasting abilities, you actually have an amazing track record at making some <laughs> incredible forecasts. I remember in 2007, you were asked what was going to happen uh, to uh, the Dow uh, in 10 years. And if I'm not mistaken, you said something about uh, Dow at 20,000 in uh, 2017. And uh, at the beginning of uh, January of 2017, the Dow hit 20,000. So that was a pretty prescient uh, and amazing <laughs> forecast over a, a decade. How do you how do you do it? What what, what? I'm tempted to say, oh shucks. <laughs> <laughs> but well, you obviously had something in mind. You you know, would, I mean, I don't. I mean, first, I don't like to do that. Sure. I don't know why I fell for doing it, but I don't do it without work. Mm-hmm. And so I used the little formula I developed, which I'll talk about more in a second of where market returns come from, mm-hmm. the source of market returns. That's what John Maynard Kent says. Mm-hmm. Don't pay any attention to past returns unless you know their sources. And that I read in Princeton University in 1951, mm. 1950, maybe 1949 even. It's certainly part of my research in the thesis because mm-hmm. that Keynes chapter on, on how the markets work is powerful. It's the best, I think it's the best chapter I could ever ask anybody to read to understand mm-hmm. the markets. So. I developed this sources of returns. He talked about investment and speculation there. So I talked about, and those were the two sources of, he didn't quite call them that, but that's what they were. And when I read that, I thought they were my sources. So I said investment return is the current dividend yield plus future earnings growth. And I estimated future earnings growth based on the earnings growth of the past 10 years. Very simple. Mm -hmm. Uh, Speculation is what market valuations do to that investment return, speculative return, and it does that. If PEs go way up, if they double over a decade, that will add 7% to the return. Mm -hmm. If they're going to add 50%, let's say they go from 20 to to, um, 40, uh, 100%, that's 7% a year added to the investment return. That's what we got in the 80s and 90s, believe it or not. Uh, All that from just speculation. And if they go down from, from a 20 to 10, uh, that's also 7% backward. Mm-hmm. And uh, so all you have to do is figure out where the PE will be mm-hmm. 10 years later compared to the present. Mm-hmm. And what I have used is um, is the PE. I used earnings growth for 10 years. I didn't mm-hmm. do a lot of research on this. And PE for 30 years. 
and figured it would come back to the mean. Mm -hmm. So what happened in, in, in predicting the Dow? Well, the 10-year earnings growth was about 5%, 6%, I guess, in the previous 10 years. And the PE was then around 20, and I expected it to go down to about 20, 22, I think, and I expected it to go down to 17 or 18. And that cost a point of that return. Mm -hmm. So we had 7% minus 1 is 6%. Mm -hmm. And actually, the number came out to be 5, so it must be it must be 6% plus a point of speculative return negative to 5. And what happened? The market return was 5%. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was a little spread, not worth talking about. And it wasn't quite as accurate as I thought, but it was a, a funny little number because that PE that I expected to go up, uh, go down, actually went up mm -hmm. and gave a point to the market return. Mm -hmm. But the earnings growth was not 6, but 4. Mm -hmm. So we got 5 from both of them. So I tell people, and I talk about this in my book, not for that particular example, um, after telling them how good my, my system has worked over 25 years, I say, hold the applause, mm -hmm. <laughs> because it can come from different sources. And you know, I, I, don't, I don't look at it as predicting. It may have looked that way a lot in the, in the Dow thing, mm -hmm. but I look at it as creating reasonable expectations. Mm -hmm. The idea is to give some investor not ways to speculate in the market, mm -hmm. because if a PE is between... 15 and 25, uh, I don't think it's worthwhile speculating up or down. Mm -hmm. Although we do know that if the PE is below 10, the odds are about 85%. It will go up during the next decade. And if the PE is above 25, the odds are about 85% it will go down the next decade. Mm -hmm. No guarantees, mm -hmm. but a way of looking, a way of framing. Mm -hmm. So I started doing this in 1990 with, with the S&P. I should come back to the Dow for just a second in case I didn't make it clear. Uh, the Dow doesn't have any dividend in it, mm -hmm. so the market return was higher than 5% mm -hmm. by probably the dividend yield was 2%, so that would give you a 7% overall market return. But the Dow doesn't have it, so I left it out. Not, not any great genius there. And uh, so I started doing this in 1990 and documented it in an article in the JPM in great detail each decade since. And the, there were erratic times. Uh, the first one was a disaster because I expected the market, the PE, to go from 13 to 10, and it went from 13 to 26. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet, and this is the this is the ticklish thing about any kind of prediction or reasonable expectations. Three years later, mm -hmm. it was back to 11, right? Because we got that big problem was overvalued, yeah. and so you, you you've got to take that into account a little bit, but it doesn't count when you count the data. But if you take all of my 15, 10-year periods to make up the 25, uh, I think my average return on the S&P was, let me say, 9.2%, and the actual average return of the S&P was 9.5. Wow. So it averages out, but there are some bad periods in there. Right. No point in not acknowledging that because that's sure. life in this business. So you know, people haven't really particularly adopted it. I call it the sources of market return, mm -hmm. right out of Keynes original notion, mm -hmm. and it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. And of course, right now we're at a time when it's amazing how opinion is varied mm -hmm. in, ter in terms of what we're facing. It's hard for me to believe we're at a new higher level of PEs. Very right. hard to believe that. Yeah. So it's hard for me to believe the market isn't fully valued. Mm -hmm. But it seems dumb even to say that today with all this <laughs> bullishness in the air. Right. So We'll see how long it lasts. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> But now this brings us to the main point of our discussion with you, which is to get your advice for our viewers about what you consider to be the perfect portfolio. Now we know there's no such thing as perfect, but uh, I suspect that TIFs will play some role uh, in this. What would you say to the typical investor now, today, looking forward? How should we be managing our wealth? Well, let me, uh, I tried to cover this, the, the, you'd be surprised at some of the, what I've done in the asset allocation chapter of my book a little bit. Because I've come to the conclusion there's really not a very good answer. Mm. And I've concluded that regular rebalancing is not terrible, but not necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, I've come to conclude that a 60-40 portfolio is probably the best option, mm -hmm. rather than going from 80-20 to 20-80 in a target retirement plan. Mm -hmm. and I may be right and I may be wrong on that. And I find it's something very individual, uh, and and you know and clearly 
I mean, everybody knows this intuitively at the beginning. There are no easy answers to this. Mm. So I'll come to exactly what I'm doing. Uh, but what I, was in, what I did, I got a letter from clearly a young man who was really worried about how he should be investing and what his allocation should be. And he said, you know, there's a dangerous, risky world out there. And he didn't mention it, but of course he's right. You have potential nuclear war, global warming, much more than just potential, and racial division in the country uh, right now, uh, threats to world trade, uh, division of wealth all over the world, but most often well, very heavily in the U.S., between the haves and the have-nots. All those things are worth worrying about, but I said to him, you don't know, and I don't know, what's going to happen to any of them. The market doesn't know. Nobody knows. So you just have to put them out of your mind and forget it. What you want to think about is how much risk you can afford, and that's very much a personal thing, and uh, has a little bit to do with whether you're investing regularly and things like that. And then I said to him, if it's helpful to you, I will tell you what I'm doing. Now, I'm 88 years old and have an unusual kind of uh, planning my estate uh, and uh, I said, I'm 50% bonds and 50% stocks. I don't happen to rebalance around that. It just seems to come out that way, particularly in recent years. And uh, it, it's been higher than that and been lower than that. But right now, I'm very comfortable at 50-50. Hmm. Although I spend half my time worrying that I have too much in stocks <laughs> and the other half of my time worrying that I have too little in stocks. <laughs> and I think that's the way most investors feel. Mm -hmm. They don't know what the right number is. And when the market's going up, they say, God, why don't I have more than more in stocks when it's going down? So you're your own worst enemy in all this. Yes. But having some stability without automatically rebalancing, I don't think you need to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very clear. You know, and anybody understanding, economists certainly understands this, that the more, the less you rebalance, the more you're going to have, mm -hmm. because you're always selling the better performing asset. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you don't know whether it'll do in the long run. But I also look at it as, as very importantly, uh, and this is, this is kind of an interesting thing. I think the most important thing you need to know about the performance of the stock market in the next 30, 40, 50 years is what is the GDP of the United States going to do? Hmm. Corporate profits are correlated at 96%. S&P dividends are correlated at 96% with, with the GDP of the United States. The GDP doesn't grow quite as fast, but not a big difference, 6.7 compared to 7.5 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then they'd the be nominal. And uh, so what, what interests me is in Peter Lynch's book, something about Wall Street, uh, one up on Wall Street or something. He says there's no number that could interest him less than the GDP number. Is it going up or down? And what that is, is a statement that the short term is more important than the long term. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe this, the short term is more important than the long term. Mm -hmm. And then you even get in Freakonomics. Mm -hmm. Those wise guys, they did a nice interview with me. I haven't heard all of it yet, but I will someday. Um, say, pay no attention to the GDP. Well, it's everything, right. but it's not everything today and tomorrow. Right. You know, the GDP probably rose today about two, three hundred and sixty-fifths of one percent or something, <laughs> whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we don't pay any attention to it. But it all comes down to, for your, you know, the best portfolio is are you an investor or are you a speculator? Mm -hmm. And if you're going to keep changing things, you are speculating because we can't know. Mm -hmm. If you're going to put commodities in there, the ultimate speculation. Mm -hmm. It has nothing going for it, no internal rate of return, no dividend yield, no earnings growth, no interest coupon, nothing except the hope, largely vain probably, that you can sell it to somebody else for more than you paid for it. How that could be even considered gold, let's say, an investment, mm -hmm. uh, I, I do not know. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's, I'd, I'd like to take the mystery out of it and say that uh, the perfect portfolio, first, I think for mm, a huge proportion, over 90% certainty of the investors, should be limited to marketable securities. Mm -hmm. They don't need the liquidity today, but, and we may have you know, too much marketability, and that is too much sensitivity to prices as they change day by day. 
but you want to get out of the idea that you always have to do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have said in my books, uh, you know, something happens and Federal Reserve does something and the traders all at the beginning of the day think it's going to cause the market to get on, so they sell and everybody else says. It has nothing to do with anything for you. And when you hear news and your broker calls up and says, do something, it's just tell them my rule is don't do something, just stand there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's a lot of the rules that apply to the investment. They're not rules that apply to ordinary life. Right. And uh, so don't do something, just stand there. So get a rough idea of what you want to allocate your money to. Now, I, I do. I'm really entirely indexed at my 50-50, uh, although all my... I can't give you the proportions because I don't remember them, but my bonds that are in my retirement plan are bond index funds, and the bonds that are in my my uh, personal account are municipal bonds, Vanguard municipal bond, short and intermediate. And so I'm reasonably comfortable with that. So I think I'm too conservative for the average investor. So I'd say the perfect portfolio, and it, it should be, well, let me just mention one other issue. Uh, tried a little bit differently. Uh, at Blair Academy, I have a scholarship fund that I'm allowed to manage. And I don't want to spend any time on it, and I don't. So here is exactly what I've done on the assumption that nobody will touch it for a long time. Uh, when I'm gone, I mean, maybe they will, maybe they won't, but what I did, this is probably 10 years ago, um, was say, put half of it in Wellington Fund and half of it in balanced index fund. The idea was not all in balanced index fund because there could be things that happen that a manager needs to adjust to. Neither of them have an international component and that's fine with me. That's I believe that's the better strategy. So that's and they would be together 90 percent of the fund. And then against two contingencies, um, just in case I put five percent in emerging market index and I hope you're sitting down. 5% in gold. Really? Yeah, in, in the event, <laughs> just a 5% hedge against some kind of catastrophe. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I, I wouldn't call that the perfect portfolio, but I, I mention it only because that's one that is distinctive, meaning you cannot touch it. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least theoretically can't touch it. It's designed to be held through all extremes. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to give you, with the two balance funds, uh, roughly 62% in equities. Mm -hmm. There's going to be, with Wellington Fund, more corporate bonds than the, than the index fund has. I think the index is something that we should be very, very careful about because it has, for the want of a better expression, too damn much in governments. Right. I don't think any individual would have an, a, a bond account 70% mm. in governments and 30% in corporates. Right. Maybe it should be the reverse. Mm -hmm. I think that makes more sense. Yeah. Can I prove that? No. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I can't. So it's looking at the long term, looking at the numbers, looking at cost above all. There's no, there's no ideal portfolio, perfect portfolio that ignores cost. Now, you know, I've seen these articles saying, well, for example, commodities, no internal rate of return, silly, uh, including gold, except that's the, if nobody's going to, nobody looking and we have something explosive, that will help and it probably shouldn't hurt you too much. Mm -hmm. This portfolio actually has done rather well in the last couple of years mm -hmm. and it's fine in the long run. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I, and actually it may be doing better than my own, but I don't, but I don't look at my performance because I'm so conservative. Right. Uh, I, look at, I look at the funds, oh. yeah, but it's almost all indexed. Right. And I do have Wellington Fund from those days with Mr. Morgan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't give that up as a sentimental matter, but I, but I should. Well, I'm sure you've heard this before, Jack, that um, uh, what you've done for the typical investor is really to democratize finance. Mm -hmm. You, more than any other single individual in the history of financial markets, have placed the power of investment in the hands of the uninitiated, yep. the, the, the individual who doesn't have expertise, and yet they can still manage a portfolio thanks to what you've accomplished at Vanguard. Well, we have to be fiduciaries. We've got to be good stewards of those assets or we won't get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we've got to have good, good values. And it, you know, a lot comes down to, and this is, a, this is about the success of Vanguard, uh, ultimately, 
It's amazing how I mean, this is somebody measure, actually measures this, uh, the trust that people have in us. And I think that's not only because the ideas have been good, but because we've o operated in an honorable manner. We've uh, maybe done a little more marketing than I would like. I regard that as a negative. Um, but uh, nowhere near uh, how much this formerly investment, now marketing business, mutual fund business generally, has become. So I think we've earned their trust. And I trust the people here, my successors, will realize that when you lose a trust, it's a lot easier to lose than to build. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I know I'm trusted. I get letters from shareholders every day, mm -hmm. literally every day. Sometimes I go out and say to Emily, uh, around noontime, any letter? I haven't gotten a letter yet. Did he come in late in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's kind of hyperbole, well, but, but not without some, yeah. some basis in fact. Well, to follow the nautical theme, I think you are the Horatio Hornblower of the, uh, <laughs> yeah. of the industry. <laughs> well, and who sh if the trumpet shall be uncertain, who shall prepare himself for battle? Yes. <laughs> that's well, St. <Saint> Paul. <laughs> on behalf of uh, all shareholders, investors, uh, institutional and individual, I want to thank you for all you've done for all of us. And uh, thank you for spending time with us and telling us this amazing journey and uh, uh, giving us advice about what the perfect portfolio is. <laughs> well, thank it's been fun much. to talk to you. And uh, I hope it'll be helpful yeah, to your yeah. viewers Absolutely. and readers. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thanks, Andy, yeah, very much it. to you.